So my name is Trevor Trainer, and uh, I'm a building science researcher for RDH uh, Building Science Limited. Um, and I'm going to talk today about the building science of air. So we're going to talk about air control um, through the building enclosure, within the building enclosure, and also about uh, air quality within the building. A little bit about uh, RDH, the company I work for. Um, basically, we are a building enclosure engineering company. Um, we are a group of engineers, architects, technologists, project managers, contractors, and researchers. I'm more in the researcher um, uh, type area. And basically, we're all about making buildings better, okay? Uh, specifically, uh, the building enclosure. So air and the built environment. So obviously air, it's all around us. I'm a big fan of air, we need it. It's our, uh, required to support life as we know it. But air can also move energy, moisture, and pollutants with it as it flows. And that's the issue that we need to deal with when it comes to uh, buildings. So we want to control the flow of air so that we can control energy, moisture, and pollutants in that air. Because if we can't control air, our buildings are going to be unhealthy, inefficient, uncomfortable, and they will also break down uh, more quickly uh, than they otherwise would or should. A few things I'm going to uh, try to address over the next uh, hour, hour and a half. Um, frequently asked questions about airflow in buildings. And we're going to try and dispel a few myths that you may have heard. A few examples, what is the, what's the difference between an air barrier and a vapor barrier? That comes up a lot. Can a building be too airtight? We hear that also. Shouldn't a building be able to breathe? I think we've probably all heard that, that uh, saying. Um, why does interior relative humidity matter? And how can ventilation reduce the interior relative humidity in a building? So we'll kind of review these at the end and, and see if I uh, did my job and answered these questions for you. So the building enclosure, this is what, we used to call this the building envelope. We found a better term is the building enclosure. Um, the building enclosure is any part of the building that separates the exterior, so the outside world, from the interior of the building. So that includes the roof, the walls, windows, doors, and also the foundation system. So of those of you who are in the... Uh, crawl space um, lecture earlier. Um, we're also talking about the foundation walls and the floor, whether it's a crawl space, whether it's a full uh, height basement. Okay, so when we talk about the building enclosure and the different parts of it, we like to talk about functional layers. So we don't like to just talk about, well, what's, what material is here? We want to know what's the function of that material? Because that really uh, determines how it's designed and how it's installed or how it should be installed and designed. So there's basically, I'm going to lock up here. There we go. So the first and most important functional layer is the water control layer. And I'm not going to really get into that. I think uh, John Eeks is going to talk about water control on Thursday. Okay? And these are in order of importance. Water control, that's the first thing you need to do in a building, control water. Not the topic of my conversation here today. Air control. Definitely the second most important control layer, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. How do we keep air from flowing through the enclosure and in and out of our building and within the enclosure? And also, how do we deal with the airflow within the building? Two other uh, important layers, again, less important than the first two, but thermal control, obviously, insulation layers, and also vapor control, which is a separate issue altogether, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, specifically how it relates to air control layers. <clears throat> so, fundamentals of air leakage. First of all, for air leakage to occur, there needs to be two things. There needs to be a pressure difference from inside to out of a building, and there needs to be a hole. If there's no pressure difference, it doesn't matter if there's a hole. And if there's no hole, there's no flow. Now, there's always going to be pressure differences from the inside to outside of a building. Um, 
Earlier today, we heard a bit about stack effect, which is the effect of uh, warm air rising, which creates pressure differences. Probably a bigger effect would be uh, prevailing winds, which way the direction the wind is coming, creating a positive pressure on one side of your building and a negative on the other. So the pressures are always there. They fluctuate. They're never constant. Um, the taller the building, the higher the uh, uh, forces we're talking about here. But even on a single story uh, home, it's an issue. So the amount of air leakage depends on two things, the air tightness of the enclosure and the size of the holes in that enclosure. Okay, so assuming there's always going to be some kind of pressure, how big are the holes? And that's what we're going to really focus on today is closing up those holes and improving the uh, air tightness of our building. So air movement and the building enclosure. Basically, there's three major things, uh, ways that airflow can affect uh, and degrade the building enclosure. And the first one is air leakage. And that's the one we usually think of, and it's the one we're going to talk about most. <clears throat> so, a red line, air leakage. So air moving from the exterior of the building to the interior of the building, OK? In order for that to occur, there needs to be holes at both the exterior and interior. Uh, and this happens all the time. Uh, and we're going to talk about ways of reducing that. Two other things you may have heard of, wind washing. Wind washing is when air is able to enter the building enclosure from the outside and then escape back to the outside. The problem with that is that it degrades the insulation uh, value, the R value of the insulation within that uh, cavity, which is a problem. We're not going to really talk too much about that. And the third is convective looping. So within the wall cavity itself, if there's a type of insulation that doesn't prevent airflow, so for example, a fiberglass bat, and then there's a air, uh, temperature difference from outside to in, there will be some forces um, that are going to create and set up a convective loop, which will again degrade the uh, insulation value that's in that wall. Not the main focus um, today, but worth mentioning. Um, basically, we're going to talk about air leakage today, though. So. I mentioned in one of our uh, frequently asked questions, what's the difference between an air barrier and a vapor barrier? Well, let's start off with the air barrier, I think. So an air barrier, guess what? It stops airflow. OK, that makes sense. Um, an air barrier may or may not allow vapor, water vapor, to pass through it, depending on what it's made of. And the air barrier basically needs to have no holes. It needs to be as perfect as possible. Okay. And in fact, it's OK to have more than one air. It's encouraged to have multiple air barriers. Could be You can use your interior drywall. You can use poly. You can use uh, Tyvek layer. The more, the better in terms of controlling airflow. Now, how is that different than a vapor barrier? Vapor barrier, and what we typically now call a vapor retarder, because a barrier isn't quite the right term, its job isn't necessary to stop water vapor, but to slow it down to a level that uh, can, the building can handle. So again, it slows water vapor. It may or may not allow air to pass through, which is something I'll kind of mention uh, later. So it doesn't need to completely stop water vapor. And believe it or not, for a vapor barrier, a hole is not a big deal. A gap, not a big deal, really, for a vapor barrier. However, for an air barrier, it's a really big deal. And that's the reason why we like to talk about these separately in terms of control layers. Because if, some, if one part of your building, let's say it's the interior poly, is acting as a vapor barrier only, as long as it's you know, kind of complete, if there's a few holes in it, not a big deal. But you still need something to control air, an air barrier. And I'll talk about um, different places where um, the air barrier could be installed. Um, and we'll talk about um, the importance of that. The other thing about vapor barriers, across an assembly, we want to make sure there's never more than one vapor barrier. If there's one on the outside and one on the inside, then any moisture that can get in that cavity was trapped. Okay? And that's when we get big, very quick uh, rotting, molding issues on double vapor barrier situations. OK, so back to air barriers, because that's going to be the main focus of our uh, presentation. So air, an air barrier is needed at all building types, all climate zones, whether it's uh, in Arizona uh, or in Alaska and anywhere in between. 
Um, an air barrier can be a system of more than one material and components. We'll kind of talk a bit about that. Um, the primary design and construction considerations for an air barrier uh, need to be how is it detailed uh, at um, things like window openings, door openings, and mechanical penetrations. These are really important. How does the air barrier close those off? Also, how easy is it to install the air barrier? Is it very difficult? Is it uh, very easy to install? Because that often, the difficulty often relates to the quality of the job in the end. And um, are the materials we're using compatible with each other? If we're using tapes or sealants, they need to be compatible with each other so that the air barrier is complete and tight for the whole lifespan of the building. And another thing which is probably um, new to a lot of people, an air barrier can be placed pretty much anywhere within the, within the enclosure, okay? And with a few caveats that we'll talk about. So why is air leakage control important? Why do we care about controlling it? Uh, I said it's like your air barrier has to be almost perfect, and why is that? So three major reasons why is because, to pr first of all, is to prevent condensation within the building enclosure. So we've all seen surface condensation on a window. If it's really cold out, you'll see some condensation on the window. What you don't see is inside your wall, anywhere where there's even a small leak, uh, an air leak, there's going to be condensation forming inside your wall. And if that condensation is, um, if it's gathering more quickly, then it can, the system can dry out, then you're going to have uh, mold and water issues inside your walls. The second reason uh, is to control heat loss through the enclosure. So air moving through the enclosure obviously can move a lot of heat, cold air in or warm air out. So um, in terms of controlling heat loss, air leakage is very important. And the last one is to main in, maintain indoor air quality within the building. And I'll talk a bit more about why that is uh, later on. So a little more specifically, so air leakage condensation. So remember we talked about vapor barriers and how we said, yeah, we should have vapor barriers, but they're really not most critical. And here's the reason. So vapor diffusion, let's, if this, in this diagram, we uh, have a piece of drywall, okay? Let's say there's no vapor barrier behind it. What we've typically seen is that over the course of a winter, uh, vapor diffusion through that piece of drywall can deposit about one-third of, of a liter of water per meter squared. Okay, so for a one meter by one meter section. So it's not good. We don't want water, that much water um, forming in our walls over the winter. But what happens if we have an air leak? If we have an air leak, even a small, you know, half inch by half inch air leak through that same wall, it can deposit a hundred times more moisture in that wall system than the vapor, you know, vapor flow. So when I say it's an air barrier is much more important than a vapor barrier, that's the reason. The, uh, the flaws in an air barrier get magnified greatly um, compared to uh, a vapor barrier. It's also important to know that controlling air leakage is a lot more difficult, and, and it's more important than controlling vapor flow. So here is, uh, this is from my master's thesis, which uh, my, my master's thesis, I tested high R walls, highly insulated wall systems. Uh, we built a bunch of them and put them in a test hut uh, on the campus at the University of Waterloo. Uh, and one thing we did is we actually injected air on purpose into the wall, interior air into the wall cavity at a very small, slow rate, something we, calculated that would be pretty normal in a house today. And here's the results from that. And this was over, just over a month and a half, I think. Um, and it's in around, uh, starting in February. So you can see all the wall systems here, before we started injecting air, were down around 12% uh, or less moisture content. The moisture content we see here is the moisture content of the OSB sheathing on the outside of the wall. And what we found uh, previously is that anything below about 20% moisture content for OSB is safe. It's not going to grow mold. It's not going to rot. Above that, it starts to get risky. So here's what happened when we put a little bit of air leakage into these walls. 
two of them shot way up. So the first one, the purple one you see here, is actually just a standard two by six wall with poly on the inside and uh, R22 fiberglass bats, okay? So you can see what happened, that, what that air leak did. It caused the moisture content of the sheathing to jump way up, and it actually followed the weather a bit with uh, warm and cold. The other wall that didn't fare well at all under these circumstances was the yellow here. It was a double stud wall. Okay? It had uh, a poly on the inside. Uh, it was like 11 and a half inch thick double stud wall with cellulose. And that same little air leak caused it to slowly but surely increase moisture content over the test period. So this sh proves the effect that we've you know, always known but we've never been able to really see um, is that even a small air leak can create uh, and inject a lot of water into a wall and create problems. Oh, there was these three other walls down here. What are these three other walls? They were walls that were just like the standard wall, two by six framing with fiberglass bats, except they had insulation on the outside of the sheathing, which was able to keep the sheathing warm. And they didn't care about the air leakage because the temperatures inside the wall cavity were below the dew point of the air. I'm going to talk a bit more about dew points uh, and other interesting facts about air in a little bit. But the main point here is, these are the, the purple is what we typically build. It's very sensitive to even small air leaks. It's important to remember. We also see air leakage condensation in our, invest, our uh, forensic investigations as we're going around. A lot of times we get called in to look at a building and the first thing the owner says is there's a my roof is leaking because there's water here, there's water in the wall. Oftentimes what we find is it's not a roof leak at all, it's condensation from the inside, usually due to air leakage and a poor air barrier uh, system. Um, lately, we've been looking at a lot of swimming pools uh, and finding this issue um, in cold climates. We also do see it in residential too, and we've seen it, here's a few examples. Oh, so. Here is air leakage that happened through um, an electrical outlet, even though it had a bit of a, a plastic barrier on it. There was still air leakage that could occur through there and condensation forming here. Okay, this is an extreme example of uh, rot of the OSB sheathing. The RH inside this house was very high, and we're going to talk about why that's important. And there was a few major flaws in the air barrier. And over only uh, eight or ten years, it completely rotted out the uh, sheathing. That's an extreme example. Um, what more frequently sees something like this, maybe the, uh, it was poorly air sealed uh, bathroom fan and uh, condensation occurred up below that and soaked the drywall or the ceiling tiles. So that's pretty common that we uh, see these in our investigations. And air leakage is often the culprit uh, when we go out to, to look at moisture issues in buildings. Now I'm going to talk about air leakage and energy. So, you know, we don't want to be uh, just giving our energy away. And here are, this is a sort of an old uh, study from 1999, but it kind of gets the point across. So this is heat loss in a typical home by component. So floor, windows, roof, walls, they each have about one-sixth uh, of the heat loss, but by far the biggest uh, heat loss occurs through air leakage, air infiltration, exfiltration through the wall system. So that was found uh, and that was done partially by uh, looking at homes and partially by modeling, uh, but we've also looked at this in our lab quite closely. So in our lab <clears throat> we have this, it's called a guarded hot box. It's a multi-million dollar piece of equipment that we can put inside of it an eight foot high by 12 foot long wall section. We clamp this box on either side of the wall section and we can determine the actual R value of the entire wall. Not just the insulation that's in there, but a combination of the insulation, the wood studs, and we can also um, allow air, air flow to occur by pressurizing one side of the box or the other. So this is just one example. Here's a wall, this is a, uh, actually a 
wall that has it made with advanced framing. So these are 24-inch uh, on centers. And I think there's going to be a presentation on advanced framing next, so that works out well. Uh, and it has R24 uh, rock wool bats inside of it. So that's the inside. You can see it has no uh, air barrier on it, or no poly, what you'd cons normally consider an air barrier. Okay? On the outside, um, it, the sheathing was left slightly gapped on purpose. Okay? So basically, in this situation, the sheathing was to be the air barrier, but it has lots of gaps in it. Right? So we put this wall in our hot box, and we closed it up, and we ran it for a couple days. And here's some of the results. So this is the R value of the wall that we put in there. Remember we had, what, R24 bats in there? Turned out it was a, more like R20 as a whole wall, which is pretty good. But that's with no air pressure across the wall. Okay? So if we don't put air pressure across the wall, remember that? If you don't have pressure, you don't have airflow. Um, yeah, it performed pretty well, right? But what happens if we put uh, air pressure across the wall? So what we did is we applied 10 Pascal pressure. And here's the actual R value of that same wall with air pressure, 10 Pascals, which is a pretty realistic value that a house could see in service in the winter. So it went from R20 down to about R12, R12 and a half. Okay? So that was pretty interesting. So we opened the box up, and we pulled our wall back out. Pulled it back out, and we sealed all the gaps with tape. And this tape is meant to go with the, this specific type of sheathing, good adhesion, works really well. We put it back in the box, closed it up, and did the same test again. What did we find? Oh, no air pressure? Sure, yeah, look at that. Oh, it got a little better, but it's about the same, R20. But now what happens when we put that air pressure across there again, so that same 10 pascals, the R value of the wall maintains over 19 because of that air barrier. Okay? So that's the difference between a good air barrier and a bad air barrier uh, when it comes to uh, heat loss, energy loss. So 40% loss due to air leakage in the one case and more like 5% in the other. Then the third thing we're going to talk about um, the reason why air tightness is important is for interior air quality. So let's say we have two houses and people with lungs in them inside the houses. So one has uh, really good air tightness, one has poor air tightness. First, let's go through the one that has poor air tightness. We've got this nice fresh air outside, and we've got to get it inside. So what's going to happen? There's pressures, we know. Instead of, uh, so basically pressures, poor air tightness, that wall is going to be, that air is going to be drawn in through the wall section, okay? Through gaps, through cracks in different areas. And it's going to filter through whatever's in there. So if this is filled, and this is a fiberglass bat we pulled out and found, you know, mold starting. This is just a, a like probably a two-month test where we were able to start showing mold growth. So that air gets filtered through that and into the house and into the people in the house. So we have two problems now. We've got poor air control. We don't know. This, all of this airflow depends on what's going, you know, what the pressure is outside. Is it a windy day? Is it cold out? Is it warm out? So this is going to change every day, almost every hour, how much air flows through. And we also, the, probably the bigger problem is we have poor air quality. We're now bringing air and filtering it through past whatever is in this cavity, whether it's mold, whether it's uh, fiberglass fibers. Uh, I know there's a presentation on radon coming. What if there was radon in the foundation? It could pull that through and into our, into our home. Now we take that same house and we make it really airtight. We do a really good job. That's up here. Now how does the air get in? Well, it's not going to get in by itself, right? We determined that. We've made it airtight on purpose. Air is not coming in on, on its own. So we need some type of mechanical system to bring that air in. We'll talk a bit more about some options there. This just happens to be an HRV. It's the most popular one we know of. So now, instead of air randomly coming through and being filtered in this 
gross wall section. It's now coming through in a purposeful way at a given rate into this uh, HRV unit. We have good control of how much air is going th into the house. And we also have good control over the quality of that air. We could filter it, um, or we can just let it come in naturally, but at least it's not picking up anything else on the way in. So without an airtight building envelope, okay, we're left with this. We're left with air is going to come in any way it can, and it's going to bring with it whatever's in the way, whether it's, uh, like I said, radon or mold or other contaminants. So we talked about why it's important for our buildings to be airtight. Um, now, what are the requirements of a good air barrier system? So what, you know, what are we looking for? Hmm, surprisingly, air impermeability is the first one. Air can't pass through it, but a lot of materials you know, meet that criteria, whether it's just a piece of plywood, uh, a brick, or a, a stone, whatever. Okay? Air can't pass through a lot of materials. So that's one, but it's, the bigger one is going to be continuity. How do we join between units of, let's say, concrete block, or let's say uh, pieces of plywood like we saw in the, in the example previously? How do we make that air barrier continuous across different aspects or different parts of this air barrier uh, system? And we also uh, need a, a material that's durable, that can make it through the construction process without getting ripped, that can handle the pressures that it's going to see inside the wall during its lifespan, okay? All these things. First, okay, so we're going back. Air impermeability, like I said, all of these uh, materials are Im impermeable to air. Concrete block, piece of wood, spray foam. Uh, this is a fancy peel and stick membrane, okay, really expensive. Yeah, they're all impermeable to air. That's fine. But, um, and they can all handle the pressures that it's, a building's going to see in its lifespan. Not a big deal. The problem being, because um, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. So yeah, like I said, most building materials are air impermeable. So that's not a big, really a big problem. Continuity is what we really need to work on. Air pressure will find any flaw in the system. Okay? It only has to be one or two small flaws. You can see here, uh, they put some Tyvek up over here, a little bit of Tipar up there, and kind of lapped them, and they're falling down. There's a hole here. Yeah, Tyvek's a great air barrier but not when it's installed like that, okay? Here's a good example, okay? And this is just like our test wall. So this is made out of the sheathing. The sheathing is the air barrier, and the tape is what completes the air barrier by closing off all the gaps. The important thing to remember in the systems like this is that there's good compatibility between the two products that are going together. In this case, uh, they're designed to go together. So the joints and the transitions in the air barrier are really the key. Um, that's why we consider, we like to call it now an air barrier system as opposed to just an air barrier because there's often a lot of different components to it that need to be tied together properly. And like I said before, for uh, air barriers, redundancy is good. If you have multiple layers for air barrier, that's great. The third uh, feature that all air barrier systems must have is durability. So they obviously need to last as long as that building is going to be in service, whether that's, you know, so 50 to 100 years, that thing needs to, uh, to do its job and keep air from flowing. It also must be able to take the stresses of assembly. You can't rip while you're putting it up, or what good is it? And also material movement, so any settling in the building, uh, sway due to wind if it's a really tall building, these type of things, wind pressures. It needs to be able to take all of those uh, forces and not break down. It also must not degrade um, due to temperature swings, because it's going to see those a lot, and potentially uh, chemicals or UV. Hopefully, in most cases, uh, there, is, there will be no uh, UV exposure, but there are some, and there are actually products available um, that are UV resistant for that reason. So the next question is, the air barrier, where should it go? So I'm sure almost everyone probably thinks of air, va air vapor barrier as being that poly sheet right inside of your wall. 
and that's traditionally what we've done. Um, I'm proposing, and we've been proposing this for a while, that uh, perhaps some alternatives are, are better. Okay? So here's the problem, I think, with an interior poly acting as your vapor barrier. It's very difficult to make it continuous. A lot of joints. So there's transitions that you got to make. Okay, so here's our blue line is now our air barrier. It comes down to the wall where the wall meets this floor joist. And now what do we do? Well, we got a couple options, I guess. We can seal it to the floor and then try and continue down here through these floor joists and cut and piece stuff in there. We could spray foam in there maybe. Uh, but eventually we got to get it down into here. So how do we make all these uh, connections and joints and how long will they last if we do? Bit of an issue. I know uh, one approach is to take the air barrier outside um, of the floor joist at these areas. Uh, we could do that um, and seal them back into the wall sections back in here. One of the issues that comes up here is the permeability of this particular product. Um, so uh, I think you'll typically see Tyvek used in this manner because we don't want to uh, have a cold side vapor barrier here. Talk a bit more about that. The air barrier, it can be on the cold side, but we don't want to have a cold side vapor barrier here. So if you used a piece of poly and did that, uh, there would be a lot of condensation occurring in there. So what's the alternative? Oh, I guess one more thing. Um, what about all those penetrations inside of your poly? So every electrical outlet. And you can buy fancy electrical boxes that are supposed to be better, and they are better, but they're definitely not uh, a complete seal. Um, what about where plumbing comes out of the wall? Lots of things penetrate this plane of the wall. So what about using the exterior as an air barrier? So we've got this same situation here. What about instead of trying to fish everything inside, we come down the outside. You can see what we've done here. We've just bridged over this troubled area, this troubled area, okay? Um, so it's easier to maintain continuity if we stay on the outside. We're also, which is a major benefit, utilizing the strength and stiffness of the sheathing. Whether we're putting a membrane on there, at least it's on something solid, or we're using, actually using the sheathing as an air barrier, which is possible. It's a nice, solid, strong surface. We avoid many of the electrical and plumbing and HVAC penetrations. All we're really left with now are the, the main penetrations out of the building, which we'll deal with. Um, there's still a potential uh, for there to be transition issues at the ceiling level. So how do we transition that to the ceiling? Um, there's a few options for that. Um, one of which is to maintain your air barrier all the way on the outside. Um, and then one of the issues, again, is the potential for this to be a cold side vapor barrier. So we don't want to use anything, any material here that is a vapor barrier. And also, we can also look into exterior insulation as a solution to a cold side vapor barrier. So remember from the chart I showed for my thesis, those three walls that didn't move, they, were, they had insulation on the outside of the, uh, this air barrier. That kept it warm enough to be below dew point temperature and for there to be no uh, condensation. And I'll talk some more about that. So I mentioned sort of considerations. Uh, air barrier material must be selected carefully, especially for exterior applications. Uh, often you see uh, the same type of uh, maybe blue skin you might see on a foundation wall um, used. And if you have, for example, a blue skin membrane on the outside and poly on the inside, then you've trapped your moisture. And this is what you get is really quick rot uh, and uh, mold formation. So we've got to be careful there. So we're watching the vapor permeance. And the vapor permeance is every material has a vapor permeance. Poly has, it's almost zero, okay? Tyvek, it's uh, I think in the 20 range. Um, so we gotta watch, um, and every material you buy for um, a uh, construction has that test done to it so we know uh, what the vapor permeance is and we can design to make sure we're not trapping moisture in there like that. I mentioned that exterior insulation. I just thought I'd put this up as a um, bit of an interesting, the, um, little bit of information. 
So I've got these same four walls, or yeah, the same uh, five walls we had before. Uh, this time, instead of injecting air into the wall system, I shut the air off, and we started injecting water onto the surface of the sheathing on the outside with a wetting mat. Okay? So what we're doing here is simulating a rain leak. What if a rain, rain hit a window and found its way inside? What would happen? Um, and the same walls again. Okay? This time, the uh, standard uh, two by six wall and the double stud wall all stayed pretty low. They were able to dry out. You can see them peak um, briefly when I injected water, but they dried out very quickly. Okay? The ones that had bigger issues were the ones that had a uh, insulation on the outside that was not vapor permeable. So we had uh, one of them was expanded polystyrene, and one of them was polyiso uh, insulation. Now, they did peak, and it, they took a lot longer to dry out. But also notice here, remember that magic kind of 20% uh, moisture content? We're still quite a bit below that. It shows that there's a risk in doing this and that we have to be careful. But also, even though I was injecting water purposely in there, we, it was still able to dry to the inside. Important point I have on that is that both of these walls had no interior poly vapor barrier. So they were able to dry to the inside. These walls did. They dried to the outside, and they, are, they dried down a little bit more quickly. So my, really, my point here is that um, if you want to use an exterior air barrier system, great idea to put insulation outside of that to keep it warmer. Just be careful of water management issues. You don't want to be injecting water or letting water get in there um, from the outside. Um, and we also don't, if we do use a material that's not vapor permeable, like foam plastic, we want to not use an interior vapor barrier, like an interior poly for that. The one uh, ex uh, exception to this is this red line, which is, uh, was an exterior insulated wall with uh, a dense rock wool, uh, Roxel product it was able to dry down just as quickly as uh, the walls that had no exterior insulation. So that's a, a little bit out of scope, but I thought I would just throw that in while we were in this section. So air tightness, okay, now we've, I think we've decided we need you know, really good air tightness, but how do we know after we're done a building whether it's airtight or not? Well, I actually don't even have to be done. The building is need to be done constructing certain portions of it. And uh, the, main, the best way to test that is from blower door testing. So basically what can be done is you replace the door of the building with a big fan. This is just not just any fan, it's a calibrated fan. We know exactly how much airflow it's moving at a given time and what pressure it's creating. So typically what we do is we run this fan under, we pressurize the house and find out how much airflow does it take to get the pressure of the house to certain things. The standard is typically up to 50 pascals of pressure. Okay? We can also do it by sucking the air out of the house. We usually like to do both, because sometimes you will get a different answer. Um, and the, again, how much airflow does it take to create 50 pascals of pressure, plus or minus, inside the house? So using this system, uh, and the best time to do this test is after the air barrier goes on, but before any of your finished materials are on, okay? So if your air barrier is the interior poly, okay, that's fine. Let's say you decide to go that way. You want to test, do a first test before the drywall goes on so that you can find and fix any problems. How do you find problems? A couple different ways. Um, if it's cold outside, um, you can use a thermal imaging camera to find the leaks. Um, if not, we can also typically use a smoke pen, walk around with the smoke pen, and look for areas where there's obviously airflow from inside to outside, or vice versa. So now we have a way of testing the tightness of our house. It's pretty good. But how tight should it be? Well, there's a few answers to that. We have to decide, I think, everyone will have to decide on their own what they feel is... Um, 
an appropriate level. But here's my suggestion. Okay, so here are some air tightness standards that exist in the building uh, community. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard, ever heard of Passive House. It's the most aggressive energy uh, certification program that's out there. They're looking for air tightness of 0.6. That's air changes per hour at 50 pascals of pressure. Way down here. R2000, okay? They're looking for 1.5 air changes per hour. Personally, I think that's about the right spot. Um, Energy Star, looking for 2.5. And ironically, the, the Ontario Building Code, there's no requirement whatsoever. I just put a big bar in there because it could be anything. There's no requirement in the OBC for air tightness. And that's why I think we need to uh, demand that on our own and not count on the code to handle that for us. So here is um, the company that I work for has done a lot of air tightness testing over the years. Um, this is a scatter plot of the air tightness okay, of the buildings uh, and the year in which they were built. So what you can see here over the years, buildings have become a lot tighter since the 50s down into modern day. Another important thing to note here is that the ones down here were all built to an uh, air tightness standard and were tested with blower doors during construction. These ones were built the way they were built and tested afterwards. Okay? Um, now a colleague of mine, uh, and he's a grad student at the University of Waterloo, his name's Justin Bregg, uh, and he has made several trips to uh, Kasachewan, and he's done some blower door testing there. I thought I would lay that over just to kind of give us an idea of where those built, uh, homes stand. It's a pretty small sample set, but gives us an idea where we're at. So what we're seeing here, so the yellow dots are the data from cash from uh, last year. You can see the trend is the same. That's good. Every, neck, every generation uh, is getting tighter and tighter. Uh, you can see we're probably not as tight as these buildings. And there's a simple explanation for that. We're not building to a code. We're not building to a standard, right? We're doing our best, and that's good. Everything's coming down. We're getting there. But without a standard to drive us down to this area, it's not, probably not going to happen. Um, just to show, so my, again, my suggestion for us, an appropriate standard is about 1.5, which puts us right in around here. Uh, there we go. OK. Now we're going to talk uh, less about air leakage and more about the air that's already inside your home. Okay? And specifically, relative humidity, the relative humidity of that air. So I could potentially try, take a couple hours and explain this graph, but it's really not that important. I just wanted to put it up there for demonstration. So what is RH? So humidity is obviously the amount of water that's in the air. Relative humidity, though, it's the amount of water that's in the air compared to the maximum amount of water that can be in the air. So it's a, that's why it's a percentage, right? So 50% RH means the air is holding half of the amount of water it could hold before it just started raining in the building. Um, and why is that important? Because the uh, amount of water that, uh, and this is where this comes into play. Oh. The amount of moisture. So this is the 100% RH line, and this is uh, temperature. So at minus 20, okay, here's the 100% RH line. That's how much water the air can hold when it's minus 20 out. What happens when it's 30 out? It's off the chart. It's up here somewhere. That's how much water. And that's why the relative part of relative humidity is important. So the warmer the air, the more moisture it can hold. So air at minus 20 at 100% RH still doesn't have much moisture in it. It's just at 100% RH, but there's not much there. And the reason why it's important, I'll explain, I think, in a little bit. 
So what affects the interior RH inside a home? Moisture generation, things that we do to create moisture in the home. Breathing, that's one. Just being alive, okay, we give off moisture. A pretty small one. Some of the other major ones, probably drying clothes, baths and showers, cooking, boiling water. So now we're getting to probably more serious uh, amounts of water. We're talking about these activities. But probably bigger than these are the moisture in building materials. So when we build a new house, there's a lot of moisture, a little bit in the wood for sure, a lot in the concrete if you're using concrete. So there's a lot of moisture that needs to get out of there from, from construction. Bigger than that is probably rain leaks and air leakage condensation that we thought of. So now that, that's a significant amount of moisture that can be added to the air um, because we're getting those uh, same building materials wet through air leakage and through uh, rain leaks, and they need to dry to the inside, especially if you have a wet foundation. That's going to be a major cause. Um, and obviously, flooding. Um, even if it's just flooding of the basement or the crawl space, all the moisture um, that those building materials are taking up during the flood, after the flood waters are gone, they need to dry out. And all that moisture is going into the air and potentially into the, uh, well, it's in, if it's inside the building envelope, um, then it's, it's in your home. You've got really high RH. So, next. Why does RH matter? Okay, so talk about high RH inside your home is not a good idea. Why does it matter? And the reason is dew point temperature. You've probably all kind of heard of it. Um, dew point temperature is the surface temperature at which condensation occurs. So again, if, whatever, if it's a wall or floor, um, it could be any surface, a window, okay? It's the temperature at which that surface will, uh, condensation will occur on that surface. And it's directly related to air temperature and RH. That's the important part here, okay? That it's dew point temperature is directly related to temperature and RH. The higher the temperature and RH, the higher the dew point temperature. We want our dew point temperature to be really low so that the surface has to be super cold before condensation occurs. So here, this chart shows, so this is the dew point temperature of air at 25 degrees Celsius. So constant temperature, okay, 25 degrees Celsius, but here's what we're, we're changing the interior RH. And we're looking at what happens to the dew point. Well, back here, if our interior RH is 20, the dew point temperature is zero. That means it ha a surface would have to be at zero degrees before dew would form. It would probably turn into frost at that point. But even up here, okay, 20, what if we have 25% RH? Now the dew point's three degrees. That's still pretty cold. So it's got to find us, the air would have to find a surface at three degrees or colder before condensation occurred, okay? Going down to the other end, once we get up into the 55, 60 range, now a temperature that's 16 degrees Celsius condensation will occur on. And you'll see that those surfaces exist in our homes all the time, windows especially, which is why you see condensation first um, on your windows. So the important takeaway here is that the higher the RH, assuming the air inside your home is pretty constant in temperature, the higher the RH, the higher the dew point temperature, so the more likely you're going to have condensation occurring. Now this is really, we're talking, if you're talking about surface, um, let me go back. If we're talking about surface temperatures, but what about the temperatures inside your wall? If we were to go back and think about our air leakage, once air gets into that wall and through the insulation, there's very cold surfaces in there for condensation to occur. That's the condensation you don't see until damage is done. So here's some more data from uh, my colleague uh, from Cash Echelon. He, we are in the process of doing um, monitoring temperature and RH in different houses throughout the community. This is a very preliminary uh, look at a little bit of data. So that's why I say typical interior RH, question mark. So this is one um, sample which we've taken. You can see the blue line indicates RH, and it seems to be sitting roughly 45%, okay? If you were to read CMHC guidelines, they want a maximum of 30%, okay? And now let's plot this on our little chart. Why does it matter? 
So if we were to plot our, grab our 45% uh, RH air, now any surface that's less than 12 degrees Celsius will have condensation on it. And we actually have an example of a window. And you can see here's the 12 is sort of the purple color. Anything purple or darker is below 12 degrees. In this case, condensation would occur. And you actually can see condensation on here, not so well on the screen, but. Um, and now that's surface condensation. And that can be an issue, but it's, it's a very small issue compared to air leakage condensation and what happens inside your walls if you allow air um, to pass through and condense inside the walls. So how do we control interior RH? Ventilation. Ventilation is our, that's the answer. Um, specifically, mechanical ventilation, like we said, um, because it's a controlled exchange of interior air and exterior air. But how does bringing in outdoor air make our, uh, reduce the RH inside our home? Let's look at this example. So let's say it's really cold out, it's snowing, and it's uh, outside, it's minus 10. That's not really cold for you probably, but I'm from southern Ontario, so. Minus 10, and the RH in the air outside is 100%, and that's why it's snowing, okay? But remember our chart, right? Now the air inside the house, let's say it's 20 degrees Celsius, normal air, temperature, and it's really high for interior air, 50% RH. So how are we going to get that RH down? What happens is when we bring in outside air, okay, into our house and warm that same minus 10, 100% RH air, when we warm it up to 20 degrees, it now becomes 12% RH air, okay? So the more we replace this air, with this air, the drier our house gets. The drier the air in the house gets. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So remember this crazy chart? If I was to plot that on here, so right there, that purple dot, you see that? That's where our outside air is, at minus 10 on our chart. We're going to warm it up. So here's temperature down here. So if we move that over and warm it up to 20 degrees, now it's not at the 100% line, it's down here at the, somewhere below the 20, yeah, down below the 20% line. So regardless of what the actual calculations are, you can see that bringing in cold air from outside and warming it up will help, help us dry our houses out, dry the air out, and reduce the RH inside the house. So we need ventilation. I think we've decided that. So what are our options? We need to be replacing indoor air with outdoor air. Well, you probably have heard about natural ventilation. We've heard, uh, if you read articles in uh, architectural magazines, they'll talk about natural ventilation, which basically just means opening your window. Um, there's also some other options like using stack vents. And the problem with natural ventilation is that it's unreliable and it's inconsistent. It all depends on the weather outside, the temperature outside, the wind. Uh, there's too many factors that are coming into play. And you, it's uncontrollable. It's always nice to be able to open a window and allow that fresh air in when you choose to do so, but you can't count on that as a strategy uh, for ventilation. So that basically leaves us with mechanical ventilation, a machine that does this for us. And what we're doing uh, when we use mechanical ventilation, we're just trading energy. So the energy to heat up that cold air and the energy to run our fans, okay, for indoor air quality and humidity control. And that's the fact that we just have to trade energy for those things. And there are some smart ways to do it. The other problem is when we're trying to decide what type of mechanical ventilation, we're often going to trade complexity and maintenance issues for effectiveness. So these are the trade-offs we're going to be thinking about. So one option we have is called supply only. What we could do is just put a fan somewhere in our house that blows air into our house from outside. 
it's going to create a pressure and the air is going to find a way. It's going to create a positive pressure in the house and air will escape wherever it can. Hopefully just, you know, small places like doors and windows. Not the best plan, but it is the way a lot of people approach it. Um, the issue here is that now that you've pressurized your house, any little gap in your air barrier could be air into the wall, condensation. It exacerbates the issues that we've been talking about with air leakage. So not recommended. The other option we have is called exhaust only. And this is basically all you need to do to meet Ontario Building Code. Okay? You just need a bathroom fan or some other fan that kicks air outside from your house. How it, the new air gets back in, wherever it can, right? Um, through cracks again. And that's pretty unreliable too. And we've seen that depending on where that air comes back in, it could be bringing things with it um, also. So now we've created a negative pressure in the house and we're sucking in stuff, air from the basement, from the foundation, through cracks in the walls, all that stuff. So it's an option, and it meets building code, but it's not recommended. That's when we get to balanced ventilation. And the most obvious example of that is an HRV. So we could, technically, we could use two fans, as long as they were properly balanced, one in, one out somewhere in the house. That's balanced ventilation and it won't pressurize your house either way. It's a possible solution, but the HRV does that all in one package and it has another big advantage to talk about. So this is just a schematic of an HRV. So what you can see here, in one port it brings fresh air in from outside, while at the same time um, getting rid of stale air from inside to outside. Okay. On this end, we have the warm, stale air from the house coming in, passing through this core to come out, right? The fresh air from outside is coming in, passing through this core, and going into your home. Now, inside this core, there's cells that separate those airs, the air, so the air can't mix. The air that's going out can't mix with the air that's coming in. But what it does, the air that's going out warms up the air that's coming in, so it shares some of the energy. And that's the recovery part of HRV. That's the, the heat recovery. So now, although it still costs us energy to run this, it still costs us some energy to heat the air we're bringing in. We're getting some of that for free, so to speak, by the core that's in this HRV. And I think that's why it's really, at this point, the, the best solution um, available at this time for, for ventilating um, homes. What was I going to say about that? I was going to say one more thing. The biggest drawback of this system is the complexity of it and the fact that it can break. There's filters that need to be cleaned. These are, that's really the complexity is the issue. Um, and that's why I think if a community is going to decide this is the way to go, which I think it is, that there needs to be someone who understands, at least one person in the community who knows how to fix them, um, who understands them really well, can balance them, and do the maintenance that's required, or teach others to do that. And I think that's probably the reason why we often, when we have seen HRVs that have been unplugged, disconnected, what have you, just not in use, is due to the complexity issue and the maintenance. So what, okay, so we know we need to ventilate, but what should we be ventilating at? What rates are going to work for us? Well, there's some standards out there. Um, first one I'm going to talk about is uh, called ASHRAE 62.2. And this is often used um, in co lots of different building codes as kind of the gold standard. Um, this is the 2004 version. And what it says is the ventilation rate is a function of the size of your home number of square feet, and the number of bedrooms it has. Okay? So they're using number of bedrooms as a proxy for how many people live there. Okay? So in this case, let's look at this. This is a 1,200 square foot house, and let's look at the number of bedrooms. Okay? If it has one bedroom, you need 20 CFM, cubic feet per minute. Okay? Uh, my example is going to be, okay, let's take a typical house. Three bedrooms, 1,200 square feet, I need about 35 cubic feet per minute, okay? 
Here's the problem I see with this, is this assumption right here, okay? Right now, number of bedrooms is a proxy for number of people. And they assume two people live in the first bedroom and one person lives in the other, be the other bedrooms. If we were to back that out and do it in a per person uh, format, I think we're gonna probably come up with something that's more applicable, um, especially in our communities that have overcrowding issues, okay? With uh, housing shortages and overcrowding. So let's look at the same house. What if, yeah, it's a three bedroom house, and it's 1,200 square feet. What if there's eight people living in there? Using the same calculations they used, except putting people back in this equation instead of bedrooms, okay? What if there's eight people living there? Well, now we need something a little bit over 70, so about double the ventilation rate. And really, that's to maintain air quality and to maintain RH um, per the studies that they've done. So this is just um, a proposal I'm throwing out there. Anyone who else wants to talk about um, if there's a better way to determine this, I'd be very interested. But I think typically the codes that are being used are potentially only about half of the ventilation rate needed in uh, situations where there's overcrowding. Um, you know, multiple people in the house per bedroom. So, quick summary here. I think we've learned, hopefully, air tightness is critical for creating comfortable, durable, efficient, and healthy homes. Okay? We didn't really talk about comfortable, but I think it's pretty clear that if you have air coming in from outside at one spot in your house, it's not going to be very comfortable near there. We've also learned why it affects durability because of the moisture that's moved through that. Efficiency we've learned about and the air quality in the healthy homes. And this is especially important um, in cold, wet, and windy environments, okay? The colder it is, the wetter it is, and uh, the higher uh, pressures we see, especially important. Um, I think that an air tightness standard should be specified for all new construction and also considered in renovations too, depending on the scope of the renovation. And we can talk about what that, the right number is, but I think uh, compliance through blower door testing is really the only answer, at least until we get to the point where we're getting consistent um, values below the level we want. Once we get every house is meeting our 1.5 air changes per hour, Nah, maybe we don't need to blow our door every one. We'll just keep building the same way. But until we get to that point, I think blower door testing is the only way. Oops, jumped ahead. Ventilation. We've learned that ventilation is critical for controlling relative humidity and indoor air quality. Okay, and I also think that a more practical ventilation standard needs to be developed. And it needs to be specified for all new construction. And I think this is another area where we could potentially extend that to existing buildings in retrofit. Oh, go okay. Going back to our questions. Let's see if we answered these things or not. So, what's the difference between an air barrier and a vapor barrier? Hopefully we've got this down. An air barrier is more important. That's the first thing. An air barrier needs to be nearly flawless. Whereas a vapor barrier, it's gotta be out, it's gotta be pretty good, but Gaps and holes in a vapor barrier, no big deal. In an air barrier, very big deal. Also, an air barrier can go anywhere in the assembly. Okay? In fact, I kind of in, we're now encouraging exterior air barriers. A vapor barrier has to be on the warm side. It's got to be on the interior in our climate. How about this one? Can a building be too airtight? No. <laughs> a building can't be too airtight. The tighter, the better. And that's where uh, controlling airflow, okay, and mechanical ventilation comes in. Because you want to know how much air is coming in and the quality of that air. And the only way to do that is have a really tight building envelope. It's also going to improve the durability of the building. It's going to make them last a lot longer. And of course, the building cannot be too airtight. Uh, here's one we talked about. Should a building be able to breathe? I don't know. No, 
a building sh air shouldn't be able to flow through a, b a building in from inside to outside. If that's what you mean by breathing, no, it should not. We should use mechanical systems in a controlled way to uh, control airflow from inside to outside. And the one but here is sometimes when people say a building should be able to breathe, they mean it should be able to dry in one direction. It shouldn't trap moisture. And in that case, it's kind of true. So the enclosure needs to be able to dry in at least one direction, interior or exterior. What we don't want to do is have two vapor barriers that trap moisture. So maybe that's what someone means when they say it should be able to breathe, is that it needs to be able to dry. If that's the case, then yes. <laughs> now, why does interior relative humidity matter? It matters because it affects the dew point. High interior RH means high dew point, which means even warm surfaces or kind of warm surfaces will have condensation. We don't want that. <clears throat> so the dew point affects if condensation occurs. And also, the dew point affects how much condensation occurs. So if you have high RH, not only does it determine where condensation will occur, how much too. So high RH will mean a lot of condensation can occur inside your walls, or even on windows if it's high enough. And how does ventilation work? How does it reduce the interior RH? Basically, ventilation gets rid of warm, moist air and brings in cold air. When that cold air is warmed up, right, it becomes dry. And depending on the rate at which we do that, um, we can maintain the proper RH inside our buildings. I think that's all I have. Yeah, that's all I got. Does anyone have any questions? Right. Yep, okay, so HRVs, um, can you use them to, uh, and retrofit them into the existing ductwork? You can. Um, they are most effective when they have their own ductwork, but um, in the cases where it's a retrofit situation, it can be done. Uh, and there are very specific instructions on where the inputs, um, where the air draws from and delivers to, to make sure that it gets spread out throughout the home. So, yes, it can be done. And um, you would use the, no, the HRV has its own fans. All it's doing is delivering air into the existing ductwork, but it has its own fan system. So you're not relying on the fans in the furnace. That's a, they're a separate. But when the furnace does kick on, the pressures that it creates overwhelm the um, HRV which is okay, because that's going to spread the warm air where you want it to. But when the uh, furnace fan isn't running, the HRV will be working to circulate that, uh, that fresh air for you. Anything else? No? All right. Well, thanks a lot. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. My diagram just showed a wall, for sure. Um, but in, in terms of the entire building envelope needs to have, be airtight. Okay, and same, same with vapor. Right, right. The, yeah, the, that is a whole other topic. But yes, so what, there's two options you've got, basically, is to use your vapor barrier as an air barrier if it's at the ceiling level. Okay. So that's going to be on the warm side again, which is good for a vapor barrier. The other option is to make your air barrier the entire outside of your building, including the roof. And that can be done um, by putting uh, overhangs and stuff on after. And that's it's definitely a bit more complicated, but that is an approach that we use to get very high... Um, uh, air tightness in a building is to wrap the air barrier continuously around the envelope and add like an add-on roof after the fact to shed the water. So spray, you're saying spraying it on top? 
Well, you can, you can. Um, there, that is a possibility. So, what I th one thing I didn't mention. Let's see if I can get back here quick. So, spray foam. Um, it's an insulation product. It's an air barrier. Potentially, it's an air uh, vapor barrier if it is closed cell spray foam. Um, but here's the problem. Potential problem. Okay, right there. We see this all the time. Wood moves. So if you're counting on the insulation between wood studs to be your air vapor barrier, okay, what happens when those studs twist? What happens when they pull away? You've got large gaps. That's why we really push for um, sheet goods, whether it's a membrane or uh, using plywood sheets or other um, sheet goods and sealing them, I find that's a, a more effective long-term approach than counting on spray foam as an air barrier. Vapor barrier, no problem, because that, remember vapor barrier, it doesn't have to be 100%. But air barrier, it's got to be good, really good. And that's, in many cases, that's not going to cut it. And in our forensic work, we see a lot of that. Anybody else? Nope. Thanks for your time.